Hello. I was trying to think of uh, simple analogies to make things readily apparent. Pixel pitch. Now, one of the reasons why backside illuminated sensors are slightly important, you only get really about a stop and a half. Sometimes, in the case more efficient ones, nearly two stops, better dynamic range with a backside illuminated, uh, backside illuminated sensor. Of course, a camera is not a sensor. Everybody talks about what sensor is in the camera. Ultimately, the sensor, depending on the camera, ultimately accounts for only about 40% of the actual image that's dropped on the card. I mean, a camera is an image processor. The image goes from the sensor, AD converters, SNR firmware, gets processed on the main board, buffered, then dropped on the card. So a camera is never a sensor. Specifically so, pixel pitch. Reason why, too, number one, getting back to the point about backside illuminated sensors on the newer cameras, is this means we're actually able to make the photo sites smaller and yet have the same amount of dynamic range. By actually changing the, the nature of where the wiring exists on uh, the sensor such that it has the highest SNR. Now, there's a triangle to digital photography and ISO has nothing to do with it, hence ISO invariance. We have a gain and time, aperture and shutter speed. The third one is SNR, is signal to noise ratio. The main reason why ETTR is so important, which is exposed to the right, which means max out the highest potential before you actually clip your specular highlights, is you get the maximum amount of signal to noise ratio or the best gain of the image on your sensor, which makes processing in Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever the hell you use much, much easier. Specifically, let's talk about clipping threshold. I'm trying to think of a simple, simple analogy, and of course I came up with one. There might be a more simple one. Is that clipping threshold is per unit of time and photo site saturation. The larger the photo sites, let's say the Nikon D4, for example. Huge eyeballs. The reason why, even though I can't stand the damn camera, the Nikon D5, which is a full frame sensor camera, only has 20 megapixels so it can stick some huge nocturnal animal eyeball photo sites on that camera so it has the best gain per unit of time and aperture. Also, too, in doing so, we've increased the clipping threshold of the camera. The Nikon D4, for example, it's kind of hard, so to say, to actually clip the specular highlights. To clip the highlights uh, on the Nikon D500, for example, however, is rather easy. But that's actually how the uh, image is as weighted in the AD converter and SNR firmware and actually how it's processed. That's not specific to the sensor because like the Nikon D850, for example, does not so easily clip the specular highlights even though it has the same pixel pitch. This is why a camera's not a sensor. It's an image processor. Let's take a little simple analogy here. I got uh, two different scenarios of uh, two boats in the river, a big boat and a little boat. The big boat, of course, corresponds to speculars, and uh, the little boat corresponds to shadows. They're sitting on the river here. Let's say this is low tide. Up here, they're both sitting underneath the bridge. The bridge is right up here. That's going to represent clipping point. Obviously, if the tide raises on the river, the mass of the uh, specular highlight is going to hit, and that's the point of maximum saturation, correct? So, there's an old saying that uh, a tide raises all ships. Isn't that true? Have you ever been out by the waters and see the little boats and the big boats and the tide comes in? Tide comes in, the big boats and the little boats are all raised up. Let's say we have a starting point really low right here. This would be a correspondence like a Nikon D5 or a Nikon D4. The amount of travel I actually have here is much greater than over here. Let's say this is a different river where the clearance between the, uh, the mast of the specular highlight to the bridge is not so far. So what's, what's the issue? This would be equivalent to, say, a DX crop sensor or a micro four-thirds sensor. We have tiny, tiny, also, too, with like an iPhone, for example, tiny, tiny little photo sites. Of course, once again, a camera is not a sensor. It's an image processor. In the future, we're going to actually have uh, adaptive resistance technology since once the speculars clip, that is when it will stop and it will continue to saturate the shadows, but that's a future technology. So here we have a lot less dynamic range potential than we do here. Why is that? A rising tide raises all ships. We have this much room between our uh, specular highlights before it actually clips, but before the mast of the specular hits the shadow, I mean, hits the uh, specular, or the bridge in this case, our little ship over here, i.e. our shadow, is able to travel a lot further than 
our little ship over here. Up here we don't have much room between our specular and our clipping point. It's to be akin to tiny little photo sites. Then our little bitty ship right here, which isn't going to travel that far. Once we reach the clipping point of the speculars, everything is shut off. We don't want to clip unless you intentionally want to do that for some sort of artistic reason. We're not going to go past our clipping point where our highlights have been completely blown out and there's nothing the hell light rumor for well they can do a little bit but not that much once they're totally blown they're totally blown so don't have that much room here do we for our speculars to hit the bridge or a clipping point this is all dynamic range why do we have much better dynamic range on a medium format sensor an icon d5 an icon d4 why was the 51 megapixel was it the canon 5dsr well, it, well, it was crummy. It had horrible dynamic rate. Yeah, because they packed a crap load of little tiny photo sites and that one. It's like, it's a full frame sensor and it's 51 megapixels. Yeah, but the little eyeballs are this. This would be like a, uh, a Canon 5DSR and this would be like the Nikon D4, for example. We got a lot of dynamic range here. However, we do have also older technology. We have inferior signal-to-noise ratio processing firmware. We have inferior uh, analog-to-digital conversion. I mean, like I said, a camera is not a sensor. But those big eyeballs on a sensor actually count for a lot. It's the same thing with buckets. And we're not talking about numbers. I mean, the numbers of buckets, because what occurs over on one side of the sensor has nothing to do with what is occurring in the center of the sensor. We actually have more time to gain greater SNR and therefore higher dynamic range with larger photo sites than we do with fo smaller photo sites. This is why ETTR is very important for great dynamic range. But ETTR is just a fancy way of saying maxing out your clipping threshold. But I mean, ETTR can be done with the tiny photo sites as well as it is with the big so photo sites. Even though we've accomplished ETTR on both of these by raising both by raising uh, the speculars all the way to the bridge, we still have less dynamic range. We maxed out the dynamic range in the tiny little photo sites, uh, um, photo sites on uh, X camera, whatever that X camera is. So. Um, larger the photo site, the longer it obviously takes to saturate. Obviously, it's going to take a longer period of time to saturate and clip the specular or the highlights here on the larger ship than it is over here, right? Much better dynamic range, much better micro contrast on the shadows. If you don't have much saturation time and low SNR on the tiny photo sites here, we're not going to have much intertonal detail on the shadows. This is why everybody wants more and more and more and more and more and more megapixels. And then the people that actually design these damn things are like, these, these, I know this is, I know for a fact, because I've talked to a few of these people, and of course this is exactly what they should be thinking. Those people are going, oh, these stupid people. They want more and more and more and more and more and more megapixels. But I mean, there's only so many ways you can flip and burn and fry and die and you know, grill a hamburger, and there's only so many different ways you can grill and flip and die a, uh, a silicon wafer. The more megapixels you cram in there, the more you, you uh, murder, <coughs> murder dynamic range, and uh, you uh, lessen uh, your clipping threshold for uh, decreased uh, signal-to-noise ratio. So you've got less micro-contrast, you have uh, less... Uh, photo site saturation, and you have less dynamic range. You can cram a bazillion megapixels on a freaking sensor. The only problem is, is you're going to have crap dynamic range, and uh, people will be complaining, oh, what's wrong with this camera? Dynamic range sucks. You know, I clip my, uh, clip my specular so easy, and I got no detail. My, all my shadows look muddy. It's like I got the best lens in the world on this camera, and I'm shooting at f1.8. Doesn't matter what you shoot at, saturation is saturation is saturation. I don't understand. I just got this 100 megapixel DX crop sensor camera. Oh my god, that would be something, wouldn't it? 100 megapixel crop sensor. <laughs> the dynamic range would be so bad, everybody would. First thing that would happen if a company just like totally went to full on dumbass and made a 100 megapixel with current technology, 100 megapixel crop sensor camera. It's everybody go, oh my god, I gotta buy it. It's a 100 megapixel crop sensor camera. 
and then come out with it, and then the test shots would be rolling out, and everybody would go, Oh my god, the shadow detail sucks! <laughs> oh, the shadows all look muddy! <laughs> Because they don't understand. The more little tiny eyeballs you cram on that sensor, the worse the dynamic range. Yeah. Dynamic range, last I recall, was slightly important. <laughs> so, here's a little story on clipping threshold, dynamic range, and uh, time to photo site saturation. Uh, tide raises all ships, right? But uh, if you stick tiny little eyeballs on your sensor, you're going to go from this to this. And you don't have much dynamic range here, you see? Yeah, yeah, no. No headroom. Kind of like Shaquille O'Neal. You ever seen Shaquille O'Neal get into a regular car? That he says, like, he can't get into any damn car because his head, <laughs> his head, his head, he's, he's always going to have his cars modified because he's so freaking huge. Yeah, no headroom equals no dynamic range. The smaller the photo side, the worse and worse and worse it gets until you end up with crap dynamic range. So it's, this camera's got a billion megapixels, and then you go, how good's the dynamic range? And then the person goes, it sucks. <laughs> this is a humorous way of discussing clipping threshold and dynamic range in digital photography. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you have a nice day. Aloha, dos vidanya, uvidimsia, paka, hasta luego. All that crap. Bye. <laughs>